if this is the way we're going to proceed, everybody, not only in the round table, can ask questions and a, a microphone will be given. Uh, so um, you just, uh, just please raise your hand and okay, so Nadia has a question. Uh, I, I will ask the first question because I'm the moderator, so I will use my power. Um, so you have, you have been speaking of Averroes. If I understand well, but I am not a specialist, I understand that Averroes was, as everybody knows, teaching in Spain. Was it in Cordoba? Cordoba? Um, uh, it, it was teaching in the 12th century, uh, uh, basically. And uh, Averroes, I understood, said that in his teaching, that he was teaching Islamic thought, by the way, uh, that only 2% of the Quran could not be discussed like, I don't know, like, for instance, that Mohammed is a prophet, like, I don't know, the unicity, well, God is one and things. But the other parts, the 98%, it's what I've been told, but I would like to check it with Nadia, actually. The 98% uh, was debatable. And he was teaching to his students to debate about it. But then, after him, I would say, like, but Nadia will tell us, 30 years after, or 20 years, there was some kind of meeting of ulemas and there was some kind of fatwa. We decided that this debate, this possibility of debating Islam, this 98% of the, of, the, of the text, was finished. So Nadia, can you tell us about that? Uh, you know, when we talk about antiquities and we talk about the Middle Ages, uh, the debate that was taking place by these intellectuals would get their heads rolling in this day and age because they were so progressive, they were so open to other cultures, other civilizations. They mainly dealt with Greek and Roman and uh, Byzantine and especially Greek philosophy, but they were so open to all that humanity had at the time. And if, if you read some of what they wrote, when I read it, I sometimes feel like if I had time, I would just take things and put them on Twitter and, people, and, and not say who it's from. And I can imagine people saying, this is from a Western Islamophobe, or, but actually it's from ancient texts. Uh, and they push the envelope so much to the extent that um, you have people even arguing that when you are a philosopher, you don't even need to practice any of the I bet that any of the rituals, because you are, you can, you can really communicate almost with, with the divine, like a prophet, that you don't even need, but some people need that. So the level of debate and, and questioning was so massive, but we've lost that. But these scholars this, were silenced. This was in Averroes. This, this was in Averroes time that you said that people could, yes. could, could not have the rituals. Like I scholars. mean, there were multiple thinkers, including Averroes, including Al-Farabi, including, and, and intellectuals like uh, Al-Mutanabbi, which is why he's called Mutanabbi, right? It, it's, he, he claimed to be almost like a prophet. Um, but all of these people were accused of blasphemy, were silenced one way or another. So continuously, one thing comes across is that our culture, humanity in fact, loses because of the silencing of this debate. We have lost on so much, and for how long do we have to lose while the other camp, extremist, is growing unhindered? If you wanna be an extremist, the road is paved. You'll have money coming, you'll have all sorts of facilitations. If you wanna be somebody producing a civilized thought, see how far you can go. You can tweet one sentence, siding with the human rights, and see what happens to you. So. Unfortunately, the imbalance continues. Thank you. So what, 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 uh, what uh, Nadia told us, which is quite interesting, is that at the time in the 12th century in Spain, in Spain, I mean, the debate had more freedom that, uh, than uh, nowadays. It's very interesting. 
I have another question because I really seek to be more intelligent after this debate than before. Um, Nadia, could you explain us? I've been told that in, in Baghdad now, there was a thinker, very uh, Puritan, very extremist, called Hambal, which means la, the Ambalit school. And, and, but before, Baghdad was very open and, uh, I would say, liberal and open to other thoughts. Can you just, in, in, in one minute, the way you, 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 you summarize the, the situation in Spain, summarize what happened in Baghdad in the ninth century with ha Hambal. You know, I regret that I'm not aware of what you, exactly what you have in mind. Hanbali. Sorry. Hanbali School of Thought. Hanbali. Hanbali. Yes. So I feel like Haytham is, it? Haytham is better prepared to answer this. Uh, hello, everybody. So um, the, the debate um, in, in this period was mainly um, much more free than what we have today. So for example, for the Arab philosopher one time, the best debate they have is that uh, who is the better, the philosopher or the prophet? Someone you said, Nadia, which is Farabi, claimed that the philosopher is higher than the prophet and he has uh, a lot of uh, qualities. For the case of, of Ibn Hanbal, Ibn Hanbal, let's say, is the, um, the predecessor of the Salafist, and he, he claims that there is one truth, and the truth needs to be literally from the text. And he defines the text as are the Quran and the said of the, uh, of the Prophet. So he mainly has this view. Also, the other view he has is that the Quran is eternal. The other liberal Muslims who were Mu'tazila, they think that the Quran was created, which means that it is placed in, this, in the history. So you, we could sometimes think that these thoughts are, since they are in time, so they, we could change them and have another view. He managed to be more closer than the Mu'tazila to the common people with the, a network of the local imams and he made his fame by this, uh, uh, speaking about uh, a lot of uh, saying that this came from the prophet and so on. And by fanatizing these people, he became a superpower. So he obliged the caliph in, 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 in Baghdad to say, OK, the commoners think like this, so let's eliminate the liberals. And we start from this, that the fanatic point of view in Islam wins because it was more closer than the commoners, than the liberals, who were really protected by the by liberal, or let's say, um, um, the despotic clere in uh, en français, uh, but not that close to the commoners, because they were so sophisticated and so knowledgeable and speaking about philosophy uh, and uh, logic, which people, I mean, common people, doesn't understand and want really something very fixed and very simple, and they were really close to the local imams, which were fanatic and doesn't understand this. So this is very interesting. We just learned how much, how much um, a powerful state, powerful laws are needed. And because otherwise, if you have demagogy and you have populism, then you, have, um, you, you don't have the protection of these, the intellectuals. You need a strong state to protect uh, intellectuals as soon as, of course, the state does not start attacking the intellectuals like we had, unfortunately, in France with uh, Louis XIV that protected intellectuals at the beginning and then, you know, made uh, all this attack with La Révocation de l'Édit Nantes in 1685, uh, not allowing the Protestants the freedom of religion. Um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I, 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 would, I would like to, to ask you, uh, and or maybe whoever wants to answer, because I said I wanted to get out more intelligent. Um, do you think that the main problem in Islam the Islamic world would be this concept that you explained us that Quran was not 
was not written by man, but by God himself. You know, in, 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 the, in Christianity, nobody thinks that it's God who, who, who wrote the Bible. I mean, everybody knows who. There's one guy called, uh, in the New Testament, Matthew and Mark, and then, and then the Old Testament called one called Eli or whatever. Um, and we, we know that the De Deuteronomy is, is, is a kind of law that was asked by the Persians and so on. Um, do you think that the main problem is that there is this belief, and, and can you tell us a little bit about this belief that in Islam that it's God himself wrote the Quran? Who wants to answer? Nadia? If you want, anybody want to add something? So this is what I was referring to when I said that we, one of the challenges to reforming Islamic thought is exactly that, the text. So if the text is really from God, how do you justify God allowing you unlimited number of girls and women to rape or raping married women? Or So it's really problematic because there are a lot of verses that are either slavery, that are crimes, that are war crimes sometimes, so this is really troubling. So people say, well, it's only for a certain context. Well, if that's true, why would God allow this atrocity at any time? It's unethical at any time. It's not okay to, have, to rape somebody or to have slavery. At any, it, it, it offends our humanity, and it could not have been right even then. So this is one of the greatest challenges, in fact, is, is the text. So a lot of Muslim scholars came close to addressing this. Uh, one is there's really a lot of, in, in, among those who are really deep into this, there's some doubt that the Quran is really the word of God because there's been many versions. And there's a, a, a well-known controversial story that Uthman bin Affan, the third caliph, who basically the Quran we have today is the version he preserved. He basically took, at the time, called for everybody to give him his version of the Quran at the time and decided to unify it. And there was one version that was with Hafsa, one of the, of the Prophet's wives, that was supposedly the most accurate. And he basically burnt everybody else's and then said, this is it. So... You, what are you saying is from Ottoman, celui qu'on appelle Ottoman in French, the third caliph, it started, the debate started to be, to yes. be in question and, 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 and forbidden. So this is problematic because Uthman, if you remember, uh, Uthman was not a very popular caliph. He was actually killed by stabbing of the other Muslims. So, so somebody who was authoritarian, uh, History is very problematic. It, Can I you could just have explain us why have, Ottoman was killed. We was maybe not not, not so, everybody knows. So this is where even I can get into trouble. <laughs> have blasphemy laws against me. Is how dare you talk about a caliph like he was a human being? We're not allowed to discuss history, we're, our own history. We're not allowed, let alone the sacred text. But how can we not? So much of how we live our lives today is determined by this text. Women don't have agency in much of the Muslim world because in the Quran, that agency was taken away. So we have to discuss this because it affects our every day. So Uthman was, was viewed as somebody who was authoritarian, who basically monopolized wealth and gave it only to his relatives uh, in breaking with the norm that there's more equality in distributing the, the wealth from, from uh, the places that were invaded by Muslim armies. So. They asked him to step down, he refused, so they literally stabbed him to death. So he was not that Rashidun that well, well led. But yeah, now you are on the blasphemy last list too. <laughs> so I have two questions, the gentleman, the lady, and then... Um, actually, it's a suggestion. Uh, I believe uh, we are a great uh, group of intellectuals, philosophers, and educated people. Um, I would like to continue with that, what uh, Niklas uh, said. We have seen religions coming and going. We have seen gods coming and going, whether 
ancient Egyptian gods, ancient Greek gods, and, 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 and. And we will see that also uh, the new uh, modern uh, religions will disappear. And I would like to put for this future view and sight uh, this new basis that we should be discuss in the 21st century, in the third millennium, not about how and when and what to accept from Christianity, from Judaism, from Islam, from Hinduism, from Buddhism. This is not really the question. The real question is that we should face for our future as intellectuals, as people that live in a progressive world. How do we organize it to live without religions? Because they have nothing to do in our political, social, and economical lives. So I'll, um, I'll sit here. I'm sorry, it looks funny to be on a podium uh, here. This is a good compromise. Um, there's, there's one thing that I think, uh, my job is to campaign, right? I mean, I'm, I'm the head of an advocacy NGO. Uh, you know, I, I stopped teaching more than 30 years ago the law and, no, not 30, well, anyway. Um, I think one element which we, uh, have um, we have to reclaim is that whenever people talk about freedom of religion, uh, whenever to people talk about intercultural dialogue, whenever people talk about um, civilizations, somehow this is uh, uh, considered to be the prerogative of religious leaders. So if you want to talk about intercultural dialogue, you put uh, a mullah and a priest and a Buddhist monk and they have the dialogue and whatever comes out is considered. Now, for me, this is obvious that if you want to have something about freedom of religion, the last people you want to agree upon is the people who have a vested interest in your soul, you know? In the best. <laughs> In the best case scenario, it will be a, a division. You know, I take this, you take that, and, uh, and then a monopoly within whatever they divide. In the worst case scenario, it will be um, a, a, an agreement on who to tolerate, you know? And, and, uh, and Mohammed has uh, allowed the monastery in Sinai to be untouched uh, as, a, as a sign of uh, the uh, you know, his generosity, and there is the concept of the people of the book, and all of that. This is what is scary, that, it, that the tolerance of one another is a, considered a positive thing. That uh, um, the, the, the idea that you tolerate, you know, grudgingly, you know, you smell a bit, but I'll tolerate you is, is the, the, the new level of what is considered enlightened. Uh, I think um, there's a number of ways of going about it, and each will have their own way. But I think reclaiming uh, uh, as a, a, an alliance, uh, a dialogue of, uh, lay, of laic people uh, across civilizations, reclaiming that as the legitimate dialogue among civilizations, first of all because we're talking about civilizations, uh, and uh, avoiding every time there is the idea of interreligious dialogue, say, ha, hold on, I have a voice too. And this is something that needs to be done systematically, because in the last 10 years we have abandoned this to the worst possible elements, supported and supportive of uh, the regimes. And at the end, I think the political nexus between uh, uh, blasphemy laws and in general, um, the, the idea that you have to, that the state has a role in enforcing a, an idea is all about the interest of, uh, um, of a state, of a regime, of a type of state 
Um, I mean, I think the dynamics of power have to be in our mind when we think about campaigning. But campaigning, we have to. Thank you very much. Um, the lady and then the gentleman. And, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? OK. Uh, my name is uh, Sara Shaltout. I'm a journalist and a poet also. Uh, I have uh, an answer for the question about Islam. I think the problem in Islam is not the text itself, um, if it came from God or not. Uh, I think the problem is making the text a closed one. Um, Al Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said that the text is opened and you can find many faces of the small text. But uh, practically, they didn't do, they, they make it closed. Uh, the Islamic associations make it closed, like Al Azhar al Sharif and so on. And they fight any, uh, any people who try to get a new uh, way to thinking. Uh, like the, uh, the, tr um, the troubles we, uh, they made with, with Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid and Hassan Hanafi and those in the, yes, um, uh, with those uh, names. Um, okay. I think they put um, some strikes with uh, laws and uh, made it like the uh, like Hadith al-Sharif uh, and they can find new new laws which, which is not in Islam by returning to something like al Hadith al-Sharif, although it is not, we are not sure that if the Prophet say it or not. Uh, okay, that's Thank all. Thank you very much. Can you, can you and then the gentleman. And the um, um, about getting back you to the... Introduce yourself again so that we... Um, I'm, I'm Haytham. Uh, I'm an engineer and uh, I work in... Um, I, I'm active in the civil society in France, an association called Laïcart, okay. to promote uh, uh, laïcity and the secularism in some places in France, which unfortunately it's abandoned in some quartier, you know. I'm, I'm from Tunisia. Um, about right now, the, the, the ideas of... Um, the view of Quran. If we return back to see um, the fourth, the, the four centuries, the beginning of the four centuries, and we see what were the discussions about the nature of the Quran, it was very rich debate, and really a lot of their thoughts was consi are considered today as blasphemy. Some of them said, "Okay, the Quran is ancient text, a very ancient, and has a kind of a divine nature." So it's absolute in the, uh, in the time, and you should take it as if it is, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, considered to be good any time in any place. This is the standard, what we see right now. The other vision said, okay, uh, the Quran is a divine word, but it's in the history, so it's created, and you could really, I mean, have another view if something, if something in time changes, which is, we still on the uh, on the divine word. There's another view which said, okay, the Quran was revealed in meaning to Muhammad, but what is the Prophet Muhammad? But the what is written in the text is his words, so with his understanding. This point of view was not done by someone liberal. It's done is done by someone called the Sayuti, which was not that liberal, but at the same time he has the courage to say this point of view. So I think that the big problem right now is to tell the, the Muslims around the world that they need to a little bit understand that what is the vision they have on the standard vision, vision they have is there is an evolution of it. And there is a good thing to show them about Quran is the good work of uh, François Duroche in Collège de France uh, he has, um, he's taking chair of the evolution and of Quran, and he's studying the scripts, the old scripts. And it shows us that we have a text that evolutes a lot. There is, was no punctuation, but after there is punctuation. And when you add punctuation, it's, you, ha you are giving a re new reading. This means that we are not with a text that is completely divine and nothing can change. We have a lot of changes and the text took at least two centuries to be stabilized. And the version what we have, which is very nice, the version what we have is the version of Cairo, 
which is made in 1928, and all the versions before are slightly different from it. So we have a text that have changed, and nothing standard, standard for it, uh, and we have a lot of people that are studying this text, what we need to communicate to people, that it's something dynamic and not static. And when you have, when you have people that integrate the thought of evolution and dynamism in their mind, they will be more open and more accepting difference uh, of belief and thoughts. Thank you. I have, uh, thank you very much. Nadia I wanted to intervene. Uh, you know, this is such an important uh, point, Haytham, and it brings us back to the blasphemy laws, is that there is so much in the history, there's so much that we, we need to do inquiry about, including the historiography, there's so much that can effortlessly prove a completely different viewpoints, but we're not allowed to go there because of blasphemy laws. We're literally being held captive by these blasphemy laws, but we're not alone being held captive, the whole world as terrorism manifests everywhere, and we're not allowed to study our own history, or debate, or, or there's no freedom of inquiry, no freedom of publication. Anybody who publishes anything, their life is threatened. But too much is at stake, and this is one, one aspect. There's really, again, when you read history, when you read these books like Sayuti he mentioned, and so many more, there's rich debate, and we should be allowed to have it. Humanity should be allowed to have it. Thank you. So I have two, uh, two people that I've not talked and a lady also. Um, so can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, Maher Gabra, I'm uh, Egyptian uh, and I am based in Washington DC and I'm with Ad Hoc. Uh, my question is for Dr. Oedet. Um, uh, so when I used to live in Egypt, um, as you know, blasphemy laws was uh, prohibiting me from doing any criticism of the religious thought. When I went to the States, and we had this conversation, but uh, uh, I was surprised that um, freedom of speech, the First Amendment in America, is so limited by the regressive left and the idea that every criticism is labeled as Islamophobic, racist, bigot, etc. So people like Majid Nawaz, for example, and Sam Harris, and many others, are targeted and discriminated because of what they do to do any kind of reform. So in the last few years under Obama, we have noticed that this uh, regressive uh, left is on the rise, and the attacks on any reformers are, are on the, is on the rise also. So my question is, what do you expect, uh, or do you expect any difference in the policies uh, in the next administration? Uh, we, we all know that most probably uh, Clinton will be the next president. She has... Uh, a higher chance to, to win the elections. So what is your expectation uh, from the next president of the United States dealing with this issue? Thank you. Uh, thank you for raising this issue. And again, I really face this myself that I, I, I want to contribute to developing thoughts for my own culture, for my own region. And yet I feel that I'm looked at like a, a traitor. How dare you want to look into this history? How, excuse me, uh, when, when is looking at history banned? And this is by Western academics who are not comfortable with me raising any issue that is not very flattering. What is this? You know, Germany looks into its Nazi Germany. Why uh, uh, na Nazi history? So why can't I look into my history, the flattering and the not so flattering? So the West is contributing to the problem in this context. And we need to continue to push to have a freedom of expression. And while honoring that there is Islamophobia, and it's absolutely wrong that somebody should be attacked for their religious beliefs, we also need to be free to look into our own history and for people to be Muslims, non-Muslims, different sects within Islam. So uh, what do I expect the next administration? Unfortunately, I don't expect much to change because unless there is really awareness that there's direct, completely and direct relationship between blasphemy laws and countering ISIS, one mean, unless you counter, if you want to eliminate all extremists, whether it's called ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Fatih al-Sham, whatever name, you have to tackle blasphemy laws. There is, it's as simple as that. So when will the West arrive at that conclusion? 
it takes two things. One is the problem is getting from bad to worse, and that will continue to be because there's not this awareness that you need to tackle blasphemy laws. So this could happen the more people like ad hoc, the more we need to continue to push for this issue because so much is at stake. Too much is at stake for us to say, well, let us just sit and watch them, watch the problem get worse and worse every day. So we have a role to play as, as people who are intellectual, people who live in the West and have the luxury. And it means withstanding these attacks against us because we want to have that freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry. But I don't expect much to change because, you know, if you're a politician, you just want to be elected. You just, and you want to appease your donors and you want to, there's, more, at, there's, they don't, it's not as important as it is for us. For us, you know, a lot of us are, I'm Jordanian American, I really wanna see my region peaceful and prosperous and I have a sentimental stake in this and so it's, there's more at stake for us so we have to continue to push and just deal with the discomfort of being attacked by Westerners, by even left, you know, people, even human rights activists sometimes, because they see in every critique an attack against Muslims. There's no definition, there's no distinction in their mind between Muslims and Islam or ideas. If I attack an idea, I am automatically attacking a billion people. That is not what this is about. There's a, a difference between me critiquing an idea and me talking about a person. And this is not a debate about people, it's a debate about ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, very square. When you attack an idea, you are not attacking one billion people. It's a very good summary. Um, I have, <coughs> um, I will have the gentleman over there and with a the lady then, and then there was Nina. Uh, oh, you, you didn't raise your Okay. So can you introduce yourself, please, sir? Afak Ahmad. Euh, de la Syrie, secrétaire général du mouvement de la société pluraliste. Je vais vous poser une question à M. Kassim et Mme Elisabeth. En français, vous pouvez répondre yeah, I will, I will en anglais. So, what is your question? I will translate it from French. Euh, moi, personnellement, j'ai une mauvaise expérience avec les organismes internationaux. I have a bad experience with international organizations. Parce que souvent, elles parlent de euh, protéger les minorités, protéger les... les Oh, uh, defendre la, uh, la liberté personnelle ou la liberté individuelle. Because uh, most of the time they, they, they speak of, 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 of protecting uh, uh, individual freedoms. Moi, personnellement, uh, j'étais persécuté en Syrie trois mois à cause de mon avis politique et en Jordanie pendant un an et trois mois uh, à cause de mon avis religieux. I was, I was, I was uh, persecuted. Uh, for like 15 months in Syria. Pourquoi vous avez été persécuté? J'ai pas compris. Parce que j'étais contre le régime, machin, ça. Pour mon avis, uh, contre euh, le régime, mais, mais it's not related to religion. C'est pas, c'est pas. Oui, oui, mais, mais la juste, religion. Juste, on parle après de l'étape de l'organisme okay, international. So, okay, okay, okay. Et uh, en Jordanie, j'ai vu plein de gens de les, les organismes internationaux. Yeah, yeah. Ils ont venu en Jordanie. Ils ont très bien écouté. Yeah. Ils ont uh, All NGOs are in Jordan and they are listened to, okay. Est-ce que vous avez une question Une question. Yeah. Uh, Qu'est-ce que vous, vous pouvez faire pour protéger uh, les gens du Moyen-Orient uh, qui sont athées, qui sont dans les minorités religieuses, yeah. uh, sauf uh, écouter et... Uh, so, votre question c'est qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour ouais. les réfugiés bah, les, sont... bah, Sauf les réfugiés. Tous les gens qui sont persécutés à, à, à cause de son avis euh, politique ou religieux. Ah, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour chrétiens euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour Votre question, c'est qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour accroître la protection des minorités religieuses ou des, des, des libres penseurs au Moyen-Orient C'est ça votre exactement, question Exactement. Ok. Qui veut répondre à ça Ok. I'll, ok. Elisabeth first, because she didn't speak, and then. Um, slowly. Okay. Um, I think there's a, it's difficult, of course, um, certainly for our organization, which is um, tiny and very underfunded. But there are a few things that we try to do. On a practical level, we try to, at the moment, our big concern has been with the Bangladeshi bloggers who are threatened with being macheted to death. So we have been trying to get them out of Bangladesh 
to help them claim asylum in um, Europe. And I know other groups have done the same. But we certainly have had differences with groups like Amnesty in terms of when we write appeals and letters. Amnesty haven't wanted to talk about them being the, um, the perpetrators being Islamist, which we thought was unreal that they didn't want to mention the religion or the, you know, the, the identity of, the, of, of those threatening the Bangladeshi bloggers. So it's difficult sometimes to work with different organizations, but um, we have been working to get Bangladeshi bloggers out. But in terms of our role at the UN, yes, it's listening, but it's also trying to create um, an atmosphere of understanding and protecting freedom of religion or belief. I have to insist upon their belief. It took a lo long time at the UN for people to say freedom of religion or belief. It is not just freedom of religion, it's freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom not to believe, just to believe in general. And it's really important for minorities, as much as for anyone else, that we insist upon this right in conjunction with freedom of expression. So even us, who have very, very little limited resources, because we, we rely on membership from around the world, but our members often don't have enough wealth to give us money, I think it's really important that we create, at least at the international level, if we can't do something for individuals on the ground, we try and foster an environment in which those with no religion or those who want to critique religion are protected and seen as moral agents and agents with rights in the same way as those with religion. And minorities, minorities, you get Christian minorities, you get Muslim minorities, you get minorities without religion. We cannot protect those without religion unless we speak up for everyone regardless of belief. I don't care where you get your, your, your belief from. It could be the Quran, the Bible, it could be Kant, Emmanuel Kant. I don't, je m'en fous. You're a human rights, you're a, you're a person with human rights, you're a moral agent, we should treat you equally regardless of what you believe. And that's what we have to, I think, emphasize at all levels. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. The floor is to Niccolo uh, Figata La Monca. Um, just that uh, it's important to be aware of the power dynamics. I say this all the time. Um, just today, there is uh, here in, uh, in Rome uh, a congress of a political party called the Radical Party. Uh, some of you will be familiar with uh, one of the leaders, who is Emma Bonino. And uh, uh, they, they wanted to have something on the Yazidis. So they wanted to have testimony from Yazidi uh, crimes. And uh, when I heard this, uh, I worried. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> and so I volunteered to be the one who organized the session is this afternoon uh, in Rome. And uh, why did I worry? because the uh, crimes committed by Daesh against Yazidis, against uh, other uh, uh, non-Wahhabist, uh, uh, and uh, uh, anybody who has a different opinion from them, is very, very easy in European political context to provide the perfect justification uh, for what the Europeans want to do about Iraq uh, uh, and Syria and about Daesh, which is to say, this is not my problem, this is uh, Putin's problem. And Putin is the only solution against Daesh because he was the only one willing to invest and put his money and put his weapons and put his army where his mouth is. Anybody else uh, is just uh, words without deeds. Therefore, there is a strong link between uh, uh, the scandal that Daesh creates and the legitimacy of Bashar al-Assad uh, uh, and Putin and uh, the Tehran involvement. So this is what I said, I'll do it, because I wanted to avoid the rhetoric about uh, Putin to win when we're talking about crimes committed against minorities in Iraq uh, and in Syria. So, uh, not to say um, that we shouldn't talk about it, saying that we should talk about it, but we should put in context how Daesh is dependent for legitimacy and for uh, uh, 
uh, its own very existence from the criminal regime of Bashar al-Assad. One is uh, a spawn of the other, more than the book. I know the book is important component in convincing people because they can quote from the book. But the, the link between the authoritarian regime, uh, the crimes committed against the people of Syria by the Syrian regime, and Daesh, I think something needs to be explained and repeated and repeated. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, one of the people that came here, and he, was, uh, he said he wanted to come here, but then was, uh, um, uh, and he asked me to bring his greetings, is, uh, is Astefo, who is a representative, one of the representatives of the uh, Syriac uh, Chaldean uh, uh, community of uh, As As Syri Syriac of Syria. The, the point being, um, those are not crimes of religion. They are crimes of power. So this is where we have to look to affect the, uh, the discourse is where the power uh, and how the, the state power and the power of the, the lives of people interact uh, between the religious leaders and, and the state. And I think this is, this is the dynamic that we have to break. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam, can you uh, stand, up, stand up, please, and introduce yourself? It works, huh? It's my own microphone. It was working. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Sana Emataq. I'm Jordanian and Italian. I live here since many years. I'm just a normal uh, citizen, as they say. I wanted to ask uh, <laughs> Nadia. Um, yesterday, by chance, I saw a video of Muhammad Arkun. Yes. You know him. He's a fantastic intellectual writer, professor. And he was talking about the decline of the Islamic thought of, as from the 13th century. And he was explaining why, what happened. And his aim is his objection. Uh, his, um, Objetivo, come si dice? <laughs> His aim is the ref to reform, to go back to these centuries as the 13th, before the 13th century. So uh, I'll tell you a personal story that by complete chance in the US, I was working as an analyst. I went to actually buy books completely political in Arabic to have a perspective on my research. And I went to this bookstore called Dar al Hikmah after the phenomenal famous library in Baghdad. And I just, I, I had my company's credit card, and I'm a bibliophile. So I literally just got this book, this book, this book, and I got a few that I thought may be relevant. And for the first time in my life, I came across intellectuals like Arkun, Muhammad. Uh, um, Tarabishi, Jabiri, uh, Nasr Abu Zaid, for the first time, and I've never heard of them. And when I started reading them, I thought, wow, we have these intellectuals? How come I never heard of them? Like in the West, everybody knows the intellectuals from Einstein to, because they're on TV, there's a discussion of their ideas, whereas in, at least in the Arabic speaking world, we don't know our best brains. We don't know the intellectuals who really have put a lot of thought into these important issues because their books are banned, they're persecuted. It's really difficult to find any intellectual who hasn't been persecuted, who hasn't been attacked, who hasn't been even jailed. Uh, so this is again where blasphemy laws have to be taken out so we can have this debate. So if, if, if we were to start in the 13th century, actually that would be too difficult because the debate back then was so ahead <laughs> of now that most people want, they, it's like a computer that you want to put much more developed software from 2016 on a 1995 computer, it'll crash, it can't take it. So our educational system today cannot take the thought of the 13th century. So what we need, you know you mentioned education, such a key issue and in fact we should have really thought about it much, much sooner. Our educational system is completely unacceptable. So I went to public schools, I went to Islamic schools, and I met people who do all over the Muslim world. 
What we are taught does not prepare us to be global citizens. It, they create the educational system that exists naturally, you see the result of that, creates an individual who is at war with the world. An individual that sees in everybody else kuffar, inferiors, infidels, so they, they, they're not curious. I, so the first thing we need to do is reform this educational system. And in Jordan, you, you're from Jordan and I'm from Jordan, there's an attempt now to reform the curricular and there's an outcry because there's math in, there's uh, Quranic verses in math uh, subjects. What, what is the Quran doing in math? Like, but this is how much there's this hegemonic Islamist, uh, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, to really Islamize everything, but it's harmful for everybody. You, you believe as much as you want, but you have no right to impose it upon another. And this, this practice of, of pushing one version of faith on everybody else, including Jordan has Christians, is not only uh, un-Islamic in some ways, I mean, maybe it's, it's unethical. So, so what do we do? Yes, we need to reform educational, uh, we need to actually create an educational system that, that produces global citizens, people who are curious about the other, able to deal with the other, without that sense of fascist superiority. You know, if you Google Qatari educational uh, software and Jews or caliphate, children are taught that the greatest moment in their history is when they were invading other countries and expanding. But if you look into that history... Of Qatar, huh? of Qatar, Qatar the country. No, the, oh, 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 you said Qatar? Qatar, the country. Oh, the country, okay. Yeah. Qatar, the country. Yeah. Qatar. yeah. So state-sanctioned educational material really produces individuals who are easily seduced by ISIS. Because if you tell a lot of people that the best moment in your history is when you were invading and killing and raping and pillaging, maybe, maybe a few would want to apply this history of caliphate and expand and invade, and this is what's happening. It's a natural result of this educational system. What we are seeing is that people who have been taught certain things are applying them. And even people in the diaspora, if you, there's, a, there's been a lot of controversy uh, um, against the educational system in a, a Saudi-sponsored uh, school in Virginia, in Washington, D.C. I mean, people want to have a connection to their homeland, so they put their kids in Islamic schools all over the world. Most of them are funded uh, by Saudi Arabia with a certain, you see that everywhere there's Wahhabi schools, there's unrest, there's civil, there's strife in the communities. Communities that, that have lived in peace for millennia are, are, are hate, they now hate each other, fight each other, they want to control women. Like, so, so why are we allowing this educational system to continue? It's an educational system that creates criminality in some ways. So we have to address this. It, again, it should not be well, it's a, a private issue. It's not a private issue. If you produce instability for the whole world, it's not your private business to teach, uh, to teach war, to teach hate. It's not a private thing. We all pay for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you very much Nadia. And she, uh, she put the finger on a very interesting thing on Wahhabism, you know, uh, the alliance between Abdul Wahab end of the 18th century with, um, with the Saud family. And what happened with America, we were teaching, uh, talking about Virginia, the, the Quincy Pact, which is in uh, uh, February 45, uh, Roosevelt on the Quincy ship decided an alliance, a strategic alliance with Saudi Arabia. And he accepted the condition of not even seeing what was happening inside the country and uh, about the ideology. It's quite fascinating that Roosevelt at the same time, after like fighting um, a fascist and, and, and a national socialist ideology, as you said, and uh, also Japanese expansionism in, in, in Asia, after fighting all that, didn't even bother to ask what kind of ideology was in power in uh, Saudi Arabia to make a 60 years pact, the Quincy Pact, which has been resumed, as everybody knows, by George W. Bush in 2005 for 60 more years. 
Uh, thank you very much. Can you ask, uh, stand up to ask a question and introduce yourself, please? So, uh, my name is Qasim Al Ghazali. I am the treasurer of Ad Hoc, and um, from Morocco, I live in Zurich. Uh, in Zurich, in Switzerland. The, I will start with a quote from uh, German philosopher Heidegger, which is somehow, I'm not sure if I'm translating that's good, but it's, it's, uh, it's like this, like the problem of theology is interpretation. And I would say the problem of Islam is also interpretation. If we would like to talk about enlightenment somehow, probably enlightenment, a part of it is reform, but also is a newborn. We need the courage also to be able to uh, point to the Quran itself and discuss it in a new way, courageous way. By the way, we will have today one of our speakers later, Hamid Abdel Samad from uh, German Egyptian, who has somehow started kind of a process in reading the Quran, not, not the, the flowery way, but many modern, moderate Muslims somehow try to do, that they come with a verse and they start to say, this verse is actually meant this and that, and it was et cetera and et cetera. Because this way, it also gives right to the fundamental, what we would call fundamentalists or extremists, it gives also legitimacy to their interpretation, because at the end, we are just interpreting uh, a text, and the fact that this text is not clear enough and could be interpreted, that's the problem. And another topic I would like also to ask, and after the second, uh, after the first, uh, uh, the second war and the Cold War, I mean, dissidents from Russia and dissidents from the ex-Soviet Union were received and welcomed and were celebrated as heroes of freedom here in Europe and in the West. Importantly, why don't we also celebrate dissidents of Islam and dissidents of, of, uh, of, of, of three thoughts? Why are we all the time have to be to suffer, first of all, from those who want us dead in our countries, in our home countries, and to suffer also from the West who sees us as Islamophobes or as uh, big road sick into, to, toward, uh, toward uh, uh, Islam? This is really uh, bothers me uh, a lot here in Europe. And I all the time tell to my friends, uh, who are free thinkers or liberals in Europe, and they have no problem with criticizing the Catholic Church and in making fun of, uh, of, of, of the Pope, etc. And as long as I would, I would quote Voltaire, and I would put it in a context of Islamism, then call Voltaire here is also an, an, an Islamophobe. And the guy, I mean, we understand, or, or Rosso, or whatever, are guys of, of, of the... the, 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 the the, 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 the modernity, etc., and that's that's really a double standard from the West and double standard from the thinkers even of the West. Those people who use it to see us, the Muslims, the Muslim countries, just as one block, and suddenly they are surprised. This is actually even racist. How come someone from the Arab world or from a Muslim world would have such opinions and would have been so enlightened? No, you should be okay with your religion. And this is actually really comes in this context of postmodernism here in Europe, and that's, that there is no absolute truth. There is nothing like to, to, and this is one of our obstacles. So to summarize what I have said, I am I support all the people who are for interpreting Islam. I consider them to be my friends, but I demand them more to be much more uh, aware of the fact that such interpretations also could not re resist the interpretation of the power, the interpretation of the religious states, etc. Thank, Thank you. you very much to make this brilliant point about dissidents were so popular uh, to, uh, dissidents were so uh, popular in the Soviet time and not, uh, and, 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 and Islam dissidents are not really heard in, in, in uh, the West. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's high time I have to, I will not conclude, I will ask our three panelists to uh, conclude what they learned from, uh, what they learned from this, from this day, because, you know, I have a duty, I'm the moderator, so I have to close this debate at 12, and it's already 2 past 12, so I will ask, I will ask my uh, panelists to conclude what they they got from this morning uh, themselves. So, uh, first panelist in Nadia. Nadia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you for this vibrant debate. I actually I want to uh, conclude with a question for our European friends. There's a lot of people here, including my co-panelist, uh, who is a lawyer. 
what can, how can you help us, those, how can you help those in the Middle East or here who want to see our countries thrive with a lot of intellectual freedom and freedom of inquiry? How can you help us here to push the debate even in Europe so that we can have debates about Islam without being attacked? Because we have the right to study and examine our own history. So how can you help us take that uh, phobia, that fear, that hysteria almost against us having that right? What can you do in Europe? Thank you. Um, it's been a very valuable and instructive um, panel for me and how much I've learned. I think what's come out of it for me personally is to remind myself of the importance of the different levels um, through which we have to advocate. So there's obviously a big need for education within the Middle East and worldwide of how religion can be positively interpreted. Because there's people who need religion. I would, I would disagree with the idea that we, we should prepare for a world without religion. I think it's unrealistic. I think it's a need for many people. And I think we have to emphasize educating it and um, educating people of their religion and how it's compliant. But I also think that there's another level at, I guess, my level at the UN where we make statements, where we don't get into theological questions. Religion shouldn't, is not even mentioned. We emphasize a secular discourse where all terms that are referred to are universalist. They're the very universalist terms that un, underpin our human rights, our equal dignity. And it's at that stage that, so I'm, I'm, I find it absolutely fascinating hearing the history of Islam and how ridiculously... Um, uh, manipulated it has been for people who want to obtain and keep power. But for me, I, I don't get into theological debates. As I said before, what I find important at that sort of supranational level, at the UN national level, is to include people of religious belief, is to include a plural group. Because I feel we're not going to make change to states and that international level unless we're much more open to people of different faiths and those without faith. So whilst it's, it's less exciting and it maybe seem less honest, it's also diplomatic. And I do think there's different levels. So I guess I've learned or I've re relearned the different levels and how important it is um, to have those um, if we want to make change. Thank you. Can you give us a two, one or two minutes conclusion of what you learned during this morning? Um, what I didn't know is uh, uh, how much the uh, fight, our own, let's say, European cultural fight against Islamophobia has a negative effect on your strife. And I think this is important uh, uh, for, uh, for us uh, who daily fight Islamophobia in our own countries uh, to realize, I think this is important. What I didn't know is to what extent uh, we're still having a debate about what the words in the book mean, and uh, we're not ready for the debate uh, whether the meaning of the words of the book uh, is relevant to how the state interacts with individuals, how individuals interact between each other. I think uh, you've said very well, there's a danger in getting drawn into the debate about the words because you legitimize the words as a source of authority, of state authority. And uh, I think at some point, uh, um, we, and I include myself within you, need to question whether that is a good direction or not a good direction. And whether it's useful to say something else, to say it doesn't matter what they mean, it doesn't matter who wrote them, because uh, um, they are only relevant to what people do themselves, not to what the state does in respect of individuals. And I think that, that is a step that um, maybe we, and I include myself in you, uh, are not ready for. But uh, I think it's, it's an important challenge. Uh, there is uh, uh, something, I sorry. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Th there is something I want to, s to tell you. It's just a statement for, to think of. Yeah. Um, Arab free thinkers are considered in their countries are in the far in the far left, and they are considered in European context in the far right. Yes. Please think about this. Yes. 
you so yeah. much. I mean, I was, when I, when I said my organization is no peace without justice, our moderator said, so you must be uh, in the far right. I said, no. no I said, no, said neoconservative, because you know neoconservative in America, uh, uh, they say that uh, justice is more important than peace. Yeah. And I said, hold on, no, I am myself in the far left. I'm much further left than the people who take their instructions from Moscow, you know? But, I mean, there is, a, there is an issue there where uh, liberal thought in Europe, uh, and I say liberal meaning uh, uh, free thought in Europe, uh, is not part of the left culture. Because the left culture has been... Uh, no, 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 no. In Europe, the, the liberal free thought is not part of the left culture, is not. In Europe, the, the left has been monopolized by the state as the solution for everything, which is the Moscow uh, tradition, which is the opposite of free thought. So be careful, this is important to know. In Europe, the left is not necessarily a, our ally, because the, the left belongs to the communist tradition, which it doesn't promote free thought, as we know. So. I mean, this is, as I say, power dynamics. Let's, uh, we, we have to be careful about that. In the US, uh, the, the, the left uh, is, uh, is liberal uh, in the sense, and yet uh, is easily purchased by the thought of anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, the guilt, uh, and, uh, which becomes very easily relativism. And therefore, uh, you know, each dictator is right because it's their culture. And female genital mutilation is right because it's their culture. And if it's not right, it's because of reasons of hygiene. So you have to do it cleanly. You know, this is something we struggle with, with UNICEF. We've, uh, we've, we've fought, I mean, my organization has worked on FGM since uh, 2000. Uh, the Italians among us know that, I mean, no peace without justice in Italy is known for FGM. Um, and uh, the fight has not been against the circumcisers or the people who cut, it has been against UNICEF because they wanted to distribute clean razor blades to do it. Because that was identified as the problem, you know? Yeah. So UNICEF branded razor blade to uh, eliminate the femininity of an individual. This, uh, this, was, this was the, anyway, three things I didn't know. One, um, yeah, I, I said it. Um, the, the issue of uh, how much you are uh, considered homophobe. Two, how much you're still talking about the book. And three, how much work there is still uh, uh, to do ahead and uh, pledging myself to do the work on your side. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will have now because to, um, to I don't want to be uh, killed by charming Rhonda, though it could be some kind of uh, Perverse pleasure. I don't want to be sentenced to 50, even 50 lashes would be too much for me. I was asked to uh, close this session. I'm sorry, uh, I see that a lot of people uh, want still to speak, but it's, uh, I have to do my duty. I'm sorry. Uh, I declare this uh, session um, over and I wish you, but we, you can, we can speak each other for coffee. And um, I wish you a very, very um, uh, interesting next debate. I learned a lot in this debate. I have to close it because I've been hired for my discipline. So I want to show you that I have discipline. Thank you very much.